This is episode seven of the Three Body Problem, a podcast on security conversations. I'm back with my friends Kostin Rayu and Juan Andres, uh, checking in from Europe and Chicago, respectively. Kostin is on vacation again, so let's start right there. What is this constant vacationing with you in Europe? It's yeah. been European. Yeah, I know, I know, I know how it feels. But um, you know, it's summer. It's very hot in Bucharest, and uh, it's a remote work. You can work essentially anywhere these days, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners also uh, can work from the mountains. I don't know. I've, I've been uh, looking at uh, John Lambert's Twitter, and he keeps posting uh, these amazing photos from. Uh, yeah. Uh, Pacific different Crest trails. Trail. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. So, and yeah, I can challenge you guys to also work from remote locations, from the desert, <laughs> from the mountains, from the moon, from Mars. One is threatening sure. you with a good time talking about yeah, hiking. Yeah, exactly. Because I because I get to record this podcast from home super often. How are uh, you, Juan? This is a Black Hat Travel Week uh, next yeah, week I'm, as well. So this is going to be a busy time for you. How are you holding up? I'm I'm all right. I'm trying to clear my head a little bit, and uh, I I'm not I'm not getting to do as much research as I used to. So I'm uh, this is me trying to like take a couple of days away from stuff and uh, get my act back together. But You're yeah, speaking I, of I miss Black Hat next week. I am speaking of Black Hat. Yeah, so Nicole Fishbein from Inteaser and I will be talking about um, trying to reverse engineer Rust and trying to tackle that problem the way we, we did for Golang. So hopefully good, that'll be a, a good time. I got, I, got, I got some plans on the podcast to talk a little bit about Las Vegas and Black Hat. Costin, but right here, is, is Black Hat still kind of like this seminal place in Europe? A, a, a place for security research among your peers in Europe and how is it viewed from Europe? Because here it is, it's become kind of this big RSA type convention with big vendors and it's become a big thing. And I go back to years ago and Charlie Miller's always talked about this, about, you know, Black Hat being this technical place where people came to put the best of the best of the best. Is it still viewed like that from Europe and from other parts of the world? I think so, yeah. And uh, to be honest, the quality of the content is still very good. Uh, Black Hat Asia is also a, a very good conference um, I, I was there in Singapore last year very very high level and very interesting uh, I mean I think one of the keynote speakers uh, was uh, from China and um, was a very very um, let's say um, political policy kind of a, kind of a talk you know the five-year plan and all that so me personally I enjoy this kind of di diversity difference of opinions and uh, difference of content so uh, it's a very interesting uh, conference and a lot of people obviously want to uh, be able to showcase their research at Black Hat all right let's pivot to the news quickly and we're gonna probably close the loop on CrowdStrike and Crowd2K um, uh, I can't believe uh, we're still talking about it's a third, Crowd2K third week in a row third <laughs> Friday in a row like the CrowdStrike the, the Crowd2K well, podcast it. you know <laughs> yeah, no, but I made it this new story today because we have a new blog from David West and it actually provides some real technical details uh, about the vulnerability, about what Microsoft has seen from their end and what's coming next. And I feel like we, we should close the loop on right there, Costin. Did you get a chance to read David Weston, who is VP at Microsoft, um, new blog? And what did you think about the communicating com communications coming out of Redmond? Come on, finally, a technical blog that delves into the problem. It has uh, uh, stack dumps. It has like the uh, essential, the deep analysis that I think was missing from CrowdStrike's uh, own blogs to the moment. I think all the details that David uh, publishes in this blog, and I advise everyone to to take a look because it's like really interesting. Uh, we kind of knew, let's say, the the cause for the crash, but uh, at the same time, it's interesting to get into uh, David's mind also understand what um, can be done in the future. So for instance, uh, one of the points which he touches and I think is uh, very good, the reason why actually we need uh, kernel drivers. And as I was saying, I think in the last episode, speed is one of the important factors. You need to have uh, most of your scanning code in kernel mode because switching between kernel mode and user mode for different uh, scan operations is slow. This is one of the reasons. And uh, the fact that Microsoft is working with different vendors to find ways just to optimize the code and make sure that it also uh, works fast in user mode with much less risks is also, I think, is very good. 
And there are good, some real world examples of this, which I saw David tweeting about as well, which is the gaming, how the gaming companies handle anti-cheat, uh, their anti-cheating technologies. And it, there's some similar, uh, uh, there's some similarities here. And Weston was saying the AV guys can learn a lot from the anti-cheating guys in how they use the kernel. But one of the things in his blog about what is next is this big reducing the need for kernel drivers to access important security data. Is there still like a little bit of a friction point there that this is like we need to work towards that? Why is, why is there a friction point there, Juan? I don't know if it's a friction point per se. Like it, it approximates some of what I was, you know, when you gave us that whole like, oh, you're, you're, uh, you're king for a day. How do you fix this situation? I mean, that is perhaps uh, my dream scenario where, you know, the kernel maintainer finds a way to enable what we need to access the kernel for in some semi-standardized fashion. At the same time, I, I don't, you know, I love Dave Weston. This is not about Dave himself, but I don't necessarily trust that we're going to get the same capabilities uh, and, and what we hope to get. I don't know. Um, speaking to the whole uh, anti-cheat side of the house, he's right. I mean, there's a great deal of talent that goes into anti-cheat and uh, they do amazing things to Kernel. I mean, if you think about it, right, online games, anything to do with like, Blizzard and Battle.net or some of these more competitive, you know, things around Steam, people playing uh, Counter-Strike and so on. There's a lot of effort that goes into anti-cheat and they're very similar techniques that are involved uh, when people are trying to design cheating and aimbots and so on. However, it's also a, just a very different paradigm, right? Like what, what I can get away with as an anti-cheat developer, um, you know what the priority piece of software is that should be running that cannot be interrupted by the anti-cheat. It's the video game. The video game is running. When the video game is running is when the anti-cheat really matters. You know that you're not supposed to kill the game, right? You know that you're supposed to allow it to function the way that it's supposed to function. And anything else in the operating system, as long as you don't cause instability, can be suspect, can be blocked, can be, you know, messed with. Because What's supposed to be taking up the priority of what your computer system is running is the freaking video game. So you have just, th there's a level of uncertainty that you remove from the development cycle that you don't get to do when it comes to antivirus, anti-malware, EDR, which is EDR needs to allow people to do whatever the hell they feel like on any given day. And that computer might just be running Spotify or it might run you know, it might be a developer's box that's doing a lot of really complex things, or it might be somebody playing video games, right? Like it, it has to accommodate everything. It doesn't have a clear sense of what sort of the priority ask is. So I, I do think that it's not that it's an unfair comparison, not at all, uh, but it is definitely a different paradigm. So like there's things that we should, you know, like Weston says, right? Like there's things that we can learn and there's a lot of knowledge there that I think we should embrace. I would also point out that it's not a one-to-one -one corollary. Costin, you're an old-school AV guy playing around with AV engines for all your career. Is there something to learn from how those guys approach it, one, and why haven't we learned from it yet? I mean, why is this now a conversation piece? Um, not just anti-cheating, but I mean, back in the days, uh, we were also doing all sorts of uh, anti-piracy things. Uh, I was developing all those uh, anti-piracy measures uh, for RAV like 25 years ago. It's like it's always the same kind of a cycle that you need to tackle um, issues. But I still believe that uh, there is a maybe kind of an analogy here with the Olympics. Uh, I don't know how, how big the Olympics are in the States, but uh, over here in Europe, they're like super, super, super big. <laughs> Everyone's watching uh, the Olympics um, almost every evening on TV. And uh, there's been like a lot of um, record-breaking um, races. So for instance, a um, Chinese uh, swimmer just uh, managed to crash the world record. I think there's a, a strong emphasis here on speed. Speed is one of the things that matters a lot. And I think that this focus for speed, which is essentially driving companies to put everything in kernel mode. And similarly, like you want your um, kernel mode the code to be super stable super fast and there is probably you know like you can't have you can't have like both at the same time so you need to focus either on uh, stability reliability and speed but as maybe cpus and systems computer systems are becoming uh, more efficient and faster maybe this problem can be tackled and just to give a, a random example here one could develop an operating system 
that is extremely, extremely stable, like pretty much where all every single operation is uh, checked from multiple points of view. Uh, but then it will become very slow. And there are such examples. I've seen uh, such examples where it takes maybe 10 minutes or 15 minutes to boot that operating system. And what they're relying on is maybe new developments in CPUs. And I think here it's probably wrong to try to tackle all these issues in software alone. I think that... Uh, uh, maybe closer cooperation with hardware vendors like uh, ARM on one hand, maybe Intel, AMD on the other, could also um, bring some bring some improvements uh, in this area to stability and speed. The the other the other item on the list is the uh, Delta, especially Delta, uh, as companies struggle with recovery and the cost for recovery. By the way, have we fully recovered yet? Are we are we hearing things that are, some places are still down, or two weeks in we're good? Because we predicted this in the first episode. We were trying to think, how long does this last? We're two weeks in. Are we all clear? I, I feel like I haven't heard any news of any new disruptions. Um, I still have friends who, uh, who are still uh, inputting uh, BitLocker keys, <laughs> if that's what you're asking for. Okay, so there's still some there's still some um, some some recovery friction going on. But Delta hasn't talked about fl- ha- filing a lawsuit, but they plan to seek compensation from both Microsoft and CrowdStrike, saying cost them an, an estimated 350 to 500 million. Uh, 176,000 refunds and reimbursement requests for 7,000 flights that had to be cancelled. A major, major disruption there. That's a legal thing that doesn't concern us and our audience. Or, or do you think there's a lingering thing there that 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 that, that applies to the liability conversation that we've been having? I think it, it's a tough it's a tough spot to be. You know, it makes perfect sense that these companies are going to seek some kind of compensation, even if they just have to say it for the sake of their own investors, right? To say that that they're passing the buck somewhere. I will be really surprised if Microsoft can be held liable in any way. I would imagine that this is the kind of, you know, the BSOD is kind of like well covered in in whatever uh, terms of service. Look, clearly the market is responding to the idea that that CrowdStrike might be in for a tough spot with this, right? They're down 42% since uh, the incident happened, which is absolutely insane. At the same time, like I would love to zoom out and have more of a conversation about software liability because and this is something we talked about, I, th- I want to say like four episodes ago, or, you know, outside of the context of Crowd2K. Yeah, the Dale Vitale um, episode, we had a long conversation yeah. about this. And I mean, frankly, this is an idea that we get from from one of Dan Gear's like many genius moments coming down the mountain 10 years early, telling us what we should think uh, and us dutifully ignoring him the way that we do. You know, he did talk about it, right? It's like he, the way that Dan Gear sets this up, if, if I remember correctly, it was a 2015 Black Hat keynote back when Black Hat had interest in keynotes. He sets up this dichotomy between either you have software liability, right, where the software manufacturer is responsible for whatever, you know, ends up happening, including vulnerabilities, etc. Um, or you have this essential sunsetting of control over the code base where you go, I am not liable for this code. Therefore, it's open source to this extent. And here you can go fix your, you know, introduce your own fixes, have people do third party patching and so on. And and it's a, it's an interesting thing. I know that this kind of gets away from where the conversation starts, but it's interesting because essentially the concept there is the regency and responsibility for the outcomes of what happens. And that's somehow being tied to your ability to retain intellectual property over software. And like that's that's a way that I want us to start thinking about this problem, because when you look at this right like this is a extremely volatile mass scale concept of software liability which is you're providing this thing people pay you for it you took down their operations you're responsible for how much money they lose it's it's one of the few real world test balloons before any notion of regulation around software liability so i would watch any lawsuit that results from this very carefully just for the sake of what kind of like, like judicial logic is going to apply to the notion of software liability. Uh, I'd just be really curious, like, you know, if and if, 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 if any of this makes it to a court, which is a big if, I would love to hear how a court approaches the notion that an unrelated third party uh, just providing you some unrelated piece of software is potentially liable for the notion that like you couldn't ticket. That's going to tell us a lot. 
uh, just for that Dan Gear scenario, where like let's assume the FCC tomorrow made that the case. That's my that's my bit of speculation. That's a, I have no insights there. I just have a lot of curiosity. Is this a big topic of conversation in Europe, Costin? In your circles, eh, you go out to European policy law conferences. You go out to these places and you hear the politicians and the and, and the folks talking. Is is software liability and and you know the Microsoft issue recently, CSRB report. Like is that a big topic out there at all? I mean, you got to bring the non-American perspective to the show. You know, he's more than just a European, right? You can't just like call him out. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Two Americans and one European. That's, yeah, that yeah. was the Walk original name of the podcast, right? Like, <laughs> give me a feel. Give me a feel for how these legal conversations um, occur. I, I think like generally in, in Europe, the legal conversations are about uh, monopoly, uh, about cloud, and the fact that our sensitive data is in your hands instead of our hands. So a lot of people, uh, you know, being just worried that, you know, one owns um, our sensitive photos or that uh, Ryan listens to our sensitive conversations. But I, I would say it's not such a big um, issue. It's definitely not as big as it is uh, uh, in the United States. Maybe the different priorities. Um, and also what I noticed uh, that a lot of these discussions, uh, they are very um, closely tied into ele electoral cycles. So... Whenever there's elections, then suddenly you see um, that discussions kind of heat up on very specific topics and politicians, you know, they do all the chess beating on particular issues they uh, they solve or the issues, I don't know, that the other side is trying to, to solve, uh, such as CSAM, for instance, uh, was kind of big with the European elections. Um, so it, uh, it really depends, depend on the on the cycle, I would say. Uh, one of the things in David Weston's blog, just to... Pivot quickly to our next story on the list is uh, talking about attestation and promotion of secure boot and secure boot technologies. And every other week or every other month, there's a new bit of research uh, showcasing secure boot bypasses and basically rendering secure boot useless. The latest is PK Field coming out of Binary. Juan, did you get a chance to look at the research and what is the yeah. significance of this? It, it's sort of fascinating. Like I, I'm friends with Dave. Weston and and he he is obviously a huge proponent of all you know it, trusted computing is his thing right so he, he'll always talk about sort of uh, whenever we talked about boot kits or or things like uh, Black Lotus was Black it from Lotus, Black Lotus. Lotus yeah Black Lotus right like whenever we would talk about in the wild examples of boot kits there was always this notion of well yeah yeah but it's old tech like it's 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 this really old stuff it's been around forever but secure boot is you know, sort of like makes all these things pointless. And uh, and I feel kind of bad because then you, you look at this is what usually happens, right? Like the people who design har hardware and software mega strategies for security are always so excited to tell you about the, the, the genius of what they designed and then threat intel people. Uh, who are used to actually looking at what happens under the hood and being informed by uh, what's out there, look at you and go, yeah, you designed something brilliant, but it was contingent on this one little bit of trust, this one little bit of humans not being, you know, vulnerable or dumb or, or careless. Um, and of course, at some point, that's going to get subverted. So what you see with PK fail is just absolutely fascinating because you go, yeah, secure boot. Absolutely. Everything works right. It turns out, of course, that there's a part of this that requires certain manufacturer keys to be secured properly. Um, and in this day and age of like mega ransomware and leaks and breaches uh, that are truly in the hundreds of gigs or, or terabytes and whatnot, it turns out one of these keys or these keys have actually leaked out before. And when you get something like that, you might as well be at catastrophic failure. I mean, when you watch the binary like demo videos, it's literally like, oh, yeah, we created a key based on this thing. We signed our package, we put it in there, we rebooted the machine. You can literally see them like booting up and having this cutesy, like ANSI art. Look, we like completely screwed your computer. But the part that gets me is once it's done restarting Windows, you go, hey, you check with Windows, you go, hey, is secure boot enabled? It goes, yep. So like you've passed all the checks, secure boot did what it was supposed to do, but there is a boot kit in place. And I think people uh, who don't follow the the malware space so closely lost that they, they may have kind of glossed over the period where rootkits and bootkits were important. And that's because 
somewhere in the Windows 7 era or Windows Vista era, whenever, uh, it might have been earlier, actually, uh, whenever uh, driver signing and enforcement came into the picture, we kind of did away with rootkits. Like, uh, like that w was actually like a sizable improvement. You kind of do away with rootkits and people forget just how bad that era was. Uh, so the notion now that we can like look at something and be like, oh, yeah, that's like bootkit city, right? Like somebody could have their malware lying so far under the hood that it underlies the operating system. And we're just kind of like that, you know, PK fail gets released last week and everyone's just kind of rolling like it's nothing. You go, dude, that is the found like one of the foundations of trust for hundreds of millions of devices can be subverted by literally anybody right now. Costin, why Not does that happen? Deal? Why do we downplay secure boot bypasses when it defeats the foundation of uh, of computing? Well, um, w one of the one of the big issues uh, is that a lot of hardware manufacturers, you know, they just want to be that. They want to be able to build amazing hardware. They want to want to build amazing computers, beautiful designs, uh, super specs, uh, fantastic hardware, and just be able to ship it. But uh, unfortunately, this is a uh, kind of an issue with uh, multiple sites. So in addition to that beautiful hardware, you still need the software. You need the, the BIOS or the UFI, the uh, Unified Extended Firmware Interface, that uh, in many cases, they cannot develop it in-house or it will take a lot of time to develop it in-house, which is why they need to buy it from um, other companies, like in this case from uh, a uh, AMI, AMI yeah. American Megatrends uh, International, which is a famous name. I mean, I remember um, building computers 20 years ago and they were booting into uh, Ami BIOS, uh, essentially. So everybody knows Ami BIOS. And I don't think that they can uh, necessarily be blamed here because what they did is uh, here's a, uh, essentially a sample of our code. You need to customize the code. You need to get rid yeah. of these default keys. Here's a default the password. When you, when, <laughs> yeah. you, when you set up this machine, change the default password. Like you, That's the way for regular people to understand it. it. Yeah. For your beautiful, amazing hardware, you need to uh, essentially remove those keys and put your own or uh, essentially do it in a secure manner. But unfortunately, again, like I was saying, it's difficult to be a hardware vendor. Your focus is, uh, and there's a lot of competition, so your focus is to deliver an amazing device. And um, on the other hand, I think it's super good that companies like Binary are looking into this issue more, um, more closely. And every time a vulnerability like this is found, and an issue like this is found, uh, it's good for everyone because the uh, next generation will be more secure and more secure. Now, there is, of course, a theoretical question about the whole um, secure boot philosophy and how, let's say, um, philosophically secure the chain is. Can, is, can this be um, uh, implemented in a totally secure manner and, or there will, will always be some kind of uh, issue, um, especially when, uh, when vendors just uh, take the code from another company and deploy it uh, without uh, inspecting it uh, in detail. In any case, I believe that it's a good thing. Secure Boot definitely helps. It's a very uh, valuable and important piece of technology that we have nowadays in our platforms. And um, going forward, we need that. So just patching and fixing vulnerabilities does an amazing thing for, for the ecosystem. Pretty scary when you when when there's it. Go ahead, Juan, because I want to I, I wanted to talk about Windows Down Date, which is a big talk coming at Black Hat from this guy called Alon Leviev from which company is he at? He's at SafeBridge, and he's figured out a way to defeat Windows Update to go downgrade uh, downgrade to all the software. And I think this is going to be one of the bigger talks coming out of Black Hat this year. But you wanted to make a point about. Um, I think. This is kind of ringing with a lot of the conversation we were having about access to the kernel uh, yesterday. Uh, there was something that, that Kosin, you said that kind of really resonated with me in the sense of um, you have these wonderful strategies, these like absolute genius level ways of trying to create security mechanisms and trying to secure a platform. Uh, and it just reminds me of the conversation we were having last, you know, last week about Apple and how they manage the kernel versus, you know, Microsoft and how they manage the kernel and sort of this giant fear about, you know, who gets to access it, why and how. Um, I think the the one thing that scares me about the way that we 
talk about secure boot, the way that we talk about trusted computing, the way that we talk about kernel management and so on, is the reason we are aware of something like PK fail is that you have a third party company binary with a dedicated research team who has made it their thing to go and actually look at how these things are implemented, look at the reality of it and come out and just come out swinging, right? Obviously it's for their own marketing value and so on. Um, but think of that dynamic, right? You have a genius system with brilliant people designing this thing and it's the third party ability to inspect what happens in reality as opposed to what happens on design docs that let us know that there is a fundamental vulnerability here that exposes hundreds of millions of devices uh, to have their you know complete root of trust for their operating system essentially subverted. That dynamic is not incidental. It's an important part of the market. It's a super important part of security. And I think for a while we understood that when we talked about the operating system and the anti-malware companies. And I'm 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 genuinely it's not scared as much as like dismayed by how much I see the big manufacturers, maintainers, operating system regents just doing away with the notion of inspectability because it is damaging to branding or maybe not necessarily like it's a nuisance to them. But I think it's a fundamental part of security to have a tension and an interplay between parties. And, and it to, has to, to be third party, right? It ha I, mean, I think it does because you ultimately you're going to fall prey to bad dynamics inside of a company, right? Like, And we see it all the time. I'm sure that someone within Microsoft or someone within Apple, someone within, you know, AMI has come out and said, hey, uh, guys, like, you know, we implemented, we, we, we designed it this way, but everyone's implementing it in this other way and it doesn't look the way we want it to. And the company is going to say, yeah, yeah, but that's not our priority right now, right? Like, or yeah, that, sure, but like, we'll, we'll come to it later, maybe in three quarters. Actually, that's not a good story for us. We won't tell it right now. That's why it has to be a third party. I think there's like, it's not even like an honorable thing as much as like if you're really serious about security and you're not factoring in inspectability, it's our problem with lockdown mode, right? It's our problem with all of like Apple's approach to iOS. You go, you guys have built the most secure panic room on earth. Awesome. Uh, what's in there right now? And they go, oh, we have no way of knowing. It's it's a complete black box. You go, okay, so if somebody breaks it's into my house, egg, I'm gonna... this is a nonstop chicken and it egg is, argument. It is not. Yes. It is yes, not. It is, it is not. Not at all. The inspectability does not entail. It, it requires breaking. subversion of security. It does. Only, only when you have to do it against the OS maintainer. That's my point. If Apple wanted to have a debug port that all it did was read only dump all of the logs of a device, they if they designed it into the hardware. There's nothing that we need to do to break security. You go and you just have, the, the manufacturer has made inspectability a part of their security features. Like, I don't want us to pigeonhole too much into this. Right, I just right. think like, that is a fun, that is something that is missing from a lot of the approaches of these different companies, which is what makes me so scared whenever we're, like right now, the notion that like Microsoft's approach to the kernel is suddenly open to reconsideration, it doesn't make me excited. It makes me scared because it make it I think they're more likely to default to locking people out without giving them a replacement mechanism to inspect than they are to be like, oh no, 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 let, let us create the perfect inspection mechanism for you that is gonna be stable. If that was the approach, I'd be fucking thrilled. I just don't think that's what's gonna happen. Kostin, isn't there something AMI could do to force more secure implementations? Isn't there something, uh, because we go back to the Microsoft, it's not Microsoft fault, it's a CrowdStrike fault. Uh, this is not AMI's fault. These are all these, you know, third parties mm -hmm. that use these test keys. And we, if, we, if we're just living in this world of, okay, we're just accepting that we're absorbing that element of risk. That's just how we live. Is that, a, is that our reality or is there something these vendors can do to force this secure by default, secure by design implementation properly. Part of the issue here is that uh, companies like Intel, AMD, they just come up with new platforms uh, every couple of months. There's some new platform, new hardware platform, a new chipset. And the problem is that for that new chipset, you need the new BIOS, you need the new firmware essentially. 
Um, and in many cases, uh, the hardware manufacturers, which is companies that build servers or laptops, they just can't keep up with all those uh, software requirements, which is why they simply choose to buy the, um, the code from a company like uh, AMI. Now, what AMI could do, I guess that maybe they can um, um, make some kind of a more stringent rules or create some kind of attestation kits that will look for those uh, kind of test keys. But again, unfortunately, the issue is that this is not the only uh, weak link in the chain, uh, embedded uh, platform keys. But there are many, many others, right. such as, I don't know, buffer overflows, vulnerabilities, unvalidated updates, uh, the ability to rewrite the flash, and so on and rewrite so on. Rewrite the logo image. And uh, logo <laughs> image and the buffer overflows in parsing uh, yeah, exactly. that image file. Um, so there's like a lot, a lot of um, these issues and a lot of things that can actually go wrong at any time, which is, uh, I say, again, it's part of, um, you are calling uh, it uh, chicken and yeah, I call it the game of life. <laughs> it's essentially, yeah. uh, there's a predator, there's always like life and death and uh, it keeps happening, which is why we still have a job in this industry. We haven't yeah. sold security and uh, probably why we are still going to have a job in 20 years, 50 years, and that, yeah. um, and so on. That's why this whole notion of fixing the software supply chain is a fallacy. Like the idea of it mm. being fixed is just an impossibility. Is that too negative a take one? Because I, I feel I like we're just, these, these are stories we're writing year after year after year after year. And we're talking about, okay, how do we make the next step forward? How do we raise the bar? How do we add cost? And no one is adding cost. It just continues <laughs> to happen. I, I think that there's a part of the defeatism of uh, the security space comes with uh, heterogeneity, sort of like the the need, the fact that so many of these things are uh, particular and different to their ecosystem. That's uh, good, and, though, right? We hate the monoculture. No, no, no. I, you know, <laughs> there's a difference between standardization and monoculture it, it, it's they're not super different but there is a difference um which is like the reason we can't come out and give standard um best practices like meaningful ones is that everybody has completely different setups right like they have totally different types of hardware totally different you know largely different software stacks and then a different way in which they've kind of like roll all this stuff together and that means that there's a reason why every time you ask security people, you know, well, how do we do this? You just eat, the answer will always start with it depends. Um, and that's because it, it has to be made contingent to the particulars of a certain stack. But at least for the sake of thought experiment, there is something to be said for the, the, the value of standardization and sort of like a universal setup in a world where every enterprise set up their network and their hardware the same way and it's like the same manufacturers the same uh sort of general compatibility then we could have a very different conversation particularly when it comes to uh secure boot when it comes to um uefi right like if we said look here's there's going to be one standard uefi package that like everybody uses and then you're going to have this whole like open source consortium that's going to try to improve UEFI as much as possible, monitor its health, uh, and so on. Um, then what we would be talking about here is, okay, how secure is that project? How well is it doing? And then how is it being adopted across the board? But you'd have one place that we can all focus together and go, okay, we're going to try to um, you know, we, we're going to try to secure this as much as possible. Monoculture is a different problem. Monoculture is saying we all exhibit the, you know, it, it, monoculture is a subsequent problem. We're all reliant on the exact same thing. And if, and when there is not if, but when there is a problem in that one substrate, we're all vulnerable. And there's a meaningful, valuable point there, but I don't think that it's such a concern at this time with general computing that we should just go, no, 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 let's all be this sort of like United Colors of Benetton ad for like computing diversity. That means that we're all such special like snowflakes that we're, we're somehow being protected by virtue of being different. No, it just means we're all insecure in a slightly different way. 
and there's no universal way for us to treat it. Like there's a tension there that I, um, I, I feel like we're jumping ahead of ourselves when we worry more about monoculture than we worry about there just not being a standard best practice. The monoculture word popped up in the last two weeks again. I mean, Dan Gear actually sure. had a new essay out uh, a week and a half ago, which I encourage everyone to read. But the, whenever, the, whenever there's this cascading failure and this kind of uh, broad scale effect from one piece of thing going down, the world will always pop up. And we thought we were out of it. Uh, you know, in mobile, we have at least multiple platforms. When they, 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 when you think about the monoculture word, Costin, what is it in <laughs> Uh I tell you, it reminds me of our uh, family doctor. Um, <laughs> and I'll explain how Romania actually solved the problem of monoculture a long time ago. And I'll tell you how. I, I visited our family doctor a couple of time ago and... Um, I guess that it's the same in the U.S. In order to do that, you need uh, to have this kind of a smart card, which essentially has your entire uh, medical prescription history on it, which you need to present it when you go to the doctor. You don't need it in the States. We're not that far advanced. We <laughs> wish we had that in the States. Not that we don't need it. We have no fucking well, clue We're like on. generations ahead, and you'll see why. So uh, I just lost my, my smart card, so... Uh, I went to the office to get a new one, like the the medical uh, insurance, uh, essentially here. It took about six months to get the new car, so I was like so happy when I got my new car. I went to the doctor, and uh, I gave her the card, and um, I noticed that she had two computers uh, on her desk. And I said, "Why do you why do you need two two computers?" And she said, "Well, here's the issue. <laughs> uh, you have a new type of a smart card now." Um, we have the software which is able to read your smart card, but unfortunately the new software doesn't read the old cards. So that's why we have two computers. One computer runs the old software for the old <laughs> people, and the new computer runs the new software for people like you. Uh, and uh, essentially, it's no longer a monoculture because you have two computers <laughs> running Windows at the same time, but two, two different generations of um, software because, yeah, People are essentially uh, it's a not dual able culture. <laughs> dual culture. It, it's such such a sad story. And uh, the other Romania has a dual culture. First, of all. <laughs> the other sad story is that the funny thing is that um, when I went with the new card, it didn't even work uh, in the new computer, and uh, it turned out to be the pin code because apparently the new cards they have the default pin code three zeros. <laughs> like the, nowhere in the world. It's like unheard of. I, I mean, please let us know. Send us comments on Twitter if uh, <laughs> your smart card has a default pin of three zeros. Mm -hmm. Like this is unheard of. Only in Romania. AMI <laughs> made the AMI <laughs> Romania made these smart cards. They just the they thought people zeros, would change right? the pins, right? Like it would. Can we stay in? Can we stay in Europe for a minute and pivot to big stories floating around tied to the Olympics around some 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 um. Uh, attacks against infrastructure, not attacks, let me just rephrase it, some train outages and some uh, what appear I to mean, be... I mean, they're attacks, they're sabotage. Yeah. Right, Forest, sabotage attacks, know. and there's some water station hacks uh, throughout Europe. Is are You guys are in the trenches listening to your you know private lists about information sharing. Is there a cyber angle to any of these headlines that we're reading in mainstream media? I don't know about a cyber angle. I mean, I'll, I'll let Kostin sort of speak to the cyber angle, you know, and, and to being more informed with it, because I, I'm keeping up with it sort of just out of the corner of my eye, um, which is why to me, like, it's so much easier to look at when I brought up the topic of the Olympics in our pre-show, I'm like, oh, look, all this Russian sabotage. And you guys are like, well, is it Russian or is it, you know, left wing, right wing, whomever uh, folks that are doing it? Um, and, and I... I, I usually pride myself in being a little more like skeptical and careful. And in conspiracy, this case, Juanito. Go, conspiracy, go, go. conspiracy <laughs> me is just simple minded, right? Like it's just, I mean, the Russians have been pulling all kinds of nonsense all around Europe for months now, including having people caught like breaking into plants and like scoping some of these places out. It doesn't take a lot for me to look at the Olympics and go, you know, they yeah, tried to sabotage... It's not I mean, an easy Russia, Russia boogeyman for everything, no. But it's only an easy one because we've seen them do it, right? Like Pyeongchang Olympics, Olympic destroyer, 
was the Russians, right? Like there's, we, you know, there's plenty of the, I don't know why they give a shit about the Olympics so much, but like you watch Icarus, right? They, they, sports oh, loyalty is a very, very, not very only that, but keep in mind that Russia is, uh, was not allowed to participate in, uh, uh, the Paris 2024 Olympics. Right. They're just not there. Right. I so mean, do we're you still... think that you think that's motivation for disrupting? I think it's obviously, um, um, it can be anyone, uh, as Juan was saying. Uh, there's no uh, proof just yet. But I think uh, John Holquist posted a very interesting thing on Twitter uh, this week, which was that uh, Russian groups were trying to uh, probe the Tokyo Olympic uh, network like 40 years ago. So they were uh, definitely interested in that as well. And uh, I mean, there were a lot of um, uh, cases that we investigated when uh, Russian groups were targeting WADA, the World Anti-Doping Agency, because of all these cases that involved uh, doping of uh, Russian athletes, uh, which, um, honestly speaking, a huge, huge issue, which is one of the two reasons why Russia is banned uh, from the Paris 2024 Olympics. Uh, the other one being that they didn't uh, essentially respect the uh, the peace, uh, the Olympic peace, which uh, um, essentially uh, means that they would have to stop the war in Ukraine two weeks before the Olympics start, which they didn't. It's a little bit ambitious, but we'll, we'll take it, you know. So there's, so you're saying there's always been cyber components to these things targeting the Olympics. The question yeah. for you, Kostin, is, is are, are we hearing about any cyber component here? Has there been any malware, any sort of malware talk, any of that? Not that much, but maybe, uh, yeah, I mean, um, uh, Harfang Lab, um, our former colleagues uh, posted uh, uh, a piece uh, about disinformation, the doppelganger uh, network mm -hmm. growing and pushing disinformation related uh, to um, all sorts of hot topics in Europe, essentially. Um, but so far, I haven't, uh, I haven't seen any kind of uh, direct malware angle to attacks against to the this uh, Olympics. One. Yes, right. Like, and I think one. that's that's what we need to 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 Ryan's questions, right? We're not looking at the Olympics and looking at Russia just because we like to look at Russia, right? Like it's there is that risk though, Juan, here in the US where everything is either China or Russia and we rush to judgment very, very quickly. Sure, but that our our collective ignorance and sort of like excitement to to rush to conclusions in this particular case is not unsubstantiated and is not random. Like what Kostin mentioned about like we've investigated attacks that had to do with the Russians and the Olympics. We weren't there. We weren't investigating like random incidents. Like when you looked at them hitting TAS, when, uh, what was it? Uh, the Tribunal for Sport and the OPCW at the same time. And, you know, they, they, there were attacks that we investigated back in the great days that were subsequently used in the hack and leaks by the same teams that were involved in the election interference of 2016. They were like, there was hand in hand Russian operations we investigated that were then involved, like that were then being used for the hack and leak stuff that happened in 2016 directly with outlets that were trying to influence American elections. Then you have the situation with Olympic Destroyer, which was the most elaborate attempt at a false flag, a sort of like trying to the Russians attacking the South Korean Olympics and then trying to pin it on the North Koreans, right? Like it's not out of the it's, it's not like we're just picking the Russians out of a lineup. We're saying you motherfuckers have done this a couple of times now over how pissy you are that you're not there to like get to show off your nationalist fervor mostly you know, largely through doping and somehow this is happening you know we're once again a third you know yet another olympics that you're not allowed to come to and all of a sudden like there's actual physical sabotage of networks and all this stuff and it's like yeah no we you know this could be anybody yeah sure but it it, it very likely <laughs> Like it's yeah. probably the same repeat perpetrator that keeps doing this shit, right? Like it's it's not beyond the pale. It is not fully a conspiracy. It's you know looking at the the the, the usual suspects, right? Costin, from your angle, do we here in the U.S. rush to judgment on Russia, China, North Korea faster than we should? Uh, well, 
Sometimes yes, I think sometimes yes, but um, if you look at the recent cases and the recent years, I, I really have absolutely no objection to what uh, Juan was saying. Like his his logic was uh, super solid. I mean, if you're a Star Trek fan, that's like Vulcan logic solid. <laughs> if you're a Star Wars fan, that's like a green lightsaber solid. I don't know. Mm, um, interesting. So no, no objections <laughs> from my side. Uh, the of waters course, are murky because of the the the, 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 the local true. political situation in France as well, which like you know they're they're able to there there's a lot of plausible deniability if even if it does have a cyber angle or it does have it it is an overt attack. Plausible deniability if you remove the overt ties between the Russians and like the French left wing parties. <laughs> like the that, it's like it's not it's it's like almost a cutout in that sense, right? So look. Yes, we are rushing any time that you don't have a uh, concrete uh, attribution right in front of you. You are rushing to some you're you are making some kind of assumption and maybe maybe it will be wrong, which is why I don't necessarily want to make the point that it's them in the Olympics in particular. But I will be surprised if it isn't is what I would say. Right. For anybody who uh, might be a little out of the loop and may not care about the cyber angle specifically, like go watch that documentary Icarus on Netflix, which has got to take the like M Night Shyamalan doesn't have shit on the director of Icarus like it starts as a sports documentary and becomes like a Russian intel like and manipulation documentary yeah, halfway through stuff to like a hole in the oh room, my god it was crazy. It was, I mean it was excellent and it's super old like if you haven't watched it please go watch it um just so you understand the importance of uh these ridiculous competitions for the Russian government uh but it, it, there's a larger issue there that I, I think is more relevant to what we usually discuss, which is clearly sabotage operations in Europe are a priority for the Russian government. And that's something we've been seeing for months, if not almost a year now, where some random person gets caught taking pictures of a power plant in Sweden. Some random person gets caught breaking into a liquid, you know, natural gas facility in Finland. Some random person gets caught. Like, there's just, like, tons of small operations in Belgium and Switzerland, like, all these different places that are all somehow tied to Russia. And even if they weren't trying to do something right now, there's a reason you prepare and there's a reason that you do this, right? Like, so it, it, it's... Um, and if you want to ask for a cyber component, um, the, to me, the shoe that never dropped is in controller or pipe dream, which was this um, ICS malware that was pretty well designed to, pre you know, presumably take down some kind of ICS plant. No, I there was it's not real. Oh no 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 no! It's real. It's uh, and there are. This was this was this this pipe dream was part of part of an uh, an original disclosure that came without IOX or without any no, 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 no. So Am I confusing it with something else? It, it's just a very specific situation. So um, in controller slash pipe dream uh, looks to have been discovered by somebody before its deployment and then handed to threat researchers who then analyzed this code base. It, it does something very specific for us. It let us know that there is a probably a defense contractor developed piece of you know malware that is meant to cause damage to some kind like a specific kind of facility um but because we never saw it deployed we don't know where it would be used or how so you have as concrete iocs as you could want which is literally like look this is how this shit looks works and and what kind of devices it's going to target but it's like going into someone's arsenal and getting to say hey look they have a bomb that only that will only work on literal liquid natural gas you go holy shit that's insane you go where are they going to use it well we don't know it's liquid natural gas but they have it and it's sitting there and it's ready and presumably they can deploy it somewhere. And it's it's an odd situation because you go, well, what's the defensive value of that? In some way, spreading awareness, letting you know the intended capabilities of a threat actor, et cetera. At the same time, I think that's one of those capabilities that we wrongly assume has been defanged because it's public. And I would suggest that there's nothing that says that that thing won't work if they try to deploy it tomorrow. You know, I just keep it in mind as, yeah, it's a, it's another bit of prep work the same way that, like, seeing some dude next to a power plant in Romania 
taking pictures and diagrams and trying to figure out how to break in is a form of preparation, but it tells, it also shows you a certain amount of intent, right? Like it's, it's not yeah. beyond the pale. Costin, you wouldn't be surprised at all if any of this comes out as having a malware angle with some sort of wipe or, or destructive component. Wouldn't surprise yeah. you. Or just planting some kind of a uh, time bomb. Uh, I think it all makes sense. Uh, I was just thinking that the other angle to this story, and maybe we're not hearing uh, a lot, is uh, uh, people might be thinking that, wow, Russia is so good at doing all these things uh, pretty much uh, all over Europe. But uh, what about... Uh, yeah, you know, doing the same in Russia. What what are the Western uh, agencies doing? And I think there's a lot of, of similar things happening, especially since the war started in Ukraine. There's a lot of uh, factories blowing up in Russia or um, power plants blowing up or like uh, troll farms getting wiped. And there was a very interesting story, by the way, about how the NSA uh, wiped one of these uh, troll factories in St. Petersburg a couple of time ago where the infection actually started from one uh, uh, Apple iPhone that was connected to a PC and the malware from the phone jumped into that PC that was essentially air-gapped. And uh, I want to see this. They Where wiped is this? everything. <laughs> it is. It is. We can find it. That's fucking um, awesome. Well, the only the only uh, thing that I was um, going to mention, and then uh, I'll go back to you to you, Ryan. I just don't want to <laughs> divert the topic for too long. But uh, I was thinking that one country that is actually um, quite public and quite open about uh, their cyber activities against Russia is Ukraine. And Ukraine has been publishing like uh, more and more about their successful operations, destructive cyber operations against uh, Russian, um, you know, finance ministry, for instance, or different uh, networks uh, in Russia and uh, with screenshots, with the proof and uh, all that. So you could say probably that the cyber warfare is kind of heating up in Europe. Uh, on both sides, um, but if you're just looking into the news, uh, there seems to be some kind of a disbalance, and we are seeing uh, a lot more more success stories. stories. About, yeah, more success stories <laughs> from uh, from Russia side. So one might think that yeah, Russia is uh, unfortunately is winning from this point of view. And you're saying don't not so fast. It might not be that clear cut. Uh, no, for sure. I think that the other uh, countries, they are a, a lot more restrained in, into the kind of things they, they are allowed to do, such as, for instance, poisoning. I mean, Russia has been using uh, uh, chemical weapons all over Europe, right? They've been trying to poison the Skripals in the UK. They've been trying to poison a Bulgarian weapons uh, dealer uh, and so on and so on. So again, there is for sure, there's less limits into what uh, Russia seems to be able to do compared to, to Western intelligence services. And I think that that also includes uh, malware operations. Especially destructive attacks that that that, that potentially uh, wreaks havoc on civilians and exactly. so on. Exactly, with yeah. significant impact on uh, people's lives, like such as attacks against hospitals uh, or um, things that can potentially impact uh, people's lives. You had a story I, that, that sorry, Quan, go. I, I was just gonna say I, I am I I will say that I am glad for the Ukrainians doing some of this. You know, there's the war and there's uh, all the complexities that come along with that. But um, if we can be a little more selfish and just sort of think about this from a Western perspective, our policy pussyfooting around um, acknowledging cyber operations has actually made it really difficult for folks to define any rules of the road, define what realistic scenarios should be considered, discussed, what is what should and shouldn't be done. Um, and I say this because like, for the most part, the U.S. will not acknowledge their use of cyber, not in meaningful ways. Like Cyber Command will say, oh, yeah, we like DM'd some people at ISIS. You're like, yeah, that's cute. But like, you know, the, the real stuff we don't talk about. And like most of the operations, most Western countries will not acknowledge. Um, success stories. Well, Where's not, the success neither, stories? But no, no, no. Neither success nor failures. They just will not talk about it, which is why when you talk policy, you end up with bullshit like the Talon Manual, like somebody in a think tank somewhere will think up sort of the like spherical chicken in a vacuum version of cyber and then tell you what you should and shouldn't do. And of course, what you're going to end up is a bunch of like mint rubbing bullshit uh, the way that you might ex express in Romania. But the, the reality of it is going to be different. And I think the reality of it we're actually getting from 
the Ukrainians coming out and say it. We did this. We did it this way. Here's the proof. This is how well it did. And this is the impact. Maybe it's good. Maybe it's not good. Maybe it's stupid. But you have real, open, public case studies that people are going to be able to reference and say, well, when the Ukrainians did this, that was a good operation. When they did that, maybe they maybe they pushed the boundary. Maybe they did a thing. You need that to have honest discussions that are not rooted in some academic's mind. Are so we I'm ruling out like warlike it. disinformation in any of that communication or are we just accepting that? No, 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 no. You don't rule it out. You have to, you know, you have to second guess everything, right? You absolutely. But it's much easier to evaluate a claim and see if it's accurate, truthful, not truthful, whatever, than it is to have uh, 10 years worth of reports about Stuxnet and no official communications that have ever been What are been you made. proposing? What are you proposing? That the U.S. government has some sort of program to publicly acknowledge and attribute themselves to issue? Like, what is, what, is, what, is, what is a real-world scenario that works for you? I'm not saying that there's... I don't have an easy answer because I, I think it would be extremely... Give me a hard answer then. No, like, no, no, Give me, no, no, give me no, no, something no. that you think would work. I, what, what I'm saying is, like, there's an extreme arrogance that comes with me telling the U.S. government and the U.S. intelligence community that they should be coming out and saying X, Y, and Z about their cyber operations. I'm sure they have some valid reasons, particularly in the context of international law and things that they just do not want. They, there's all kinds of reasons why governments don't acknowledge things that all of us know, but that they refuse to acknowledge. So I'm not pretending it's simple and easy. I'm just saying... The, the USIC has a tendency to default to secrecy and silence even when the silence causes more damage than the operations or the acknowledgments themselves. Uh, and that happened in the aftermath of the Snowden leaks. It happened in the aftermath of the Shadow Brokers leaks. It's, it, happens, it, it happened in the aftermath of the election interference of 2016. Like the, the USIC defaults to silence in a way that allows more damage to be carried out on the basis of what's left unsaid. Give me a and proposal. When, Give me a proposal. Give me an idea of how you think it, like it, taking all these equities into consideration, all the legal issues, international law. Like, like should should we have acknowledged Stuxnet by now? Is there an importance to this in signaling your capabilities? Like, what are you proposing? I, I mean, obviously there is an importance in signaling capabilities, but I don't think that's going to happen. What I am proposing is, to some extent, there should be they, they should try to lean into an official record of things like. I mean, it doesn't have to be Stuxnet, but like some act. We do need some case studies of where cyber has made a meaningful difference. It's the where are your success stories? There you go. Uh, you know, and, and frankly. I would love for it to be Stuxnet. I know why it's not, but I would love for it to be Stuxnet because Stuxnet is simultaneously a landmark case, a complex use, and a situation that is both a success and failure story. So I think that would be a really good case study. That is just such a meaningful one. And we have I it though with the Kim Zetter book, and we that, have. But that's not them. That's Kim Zetter doing unbelievable work. That's us doing a bunch of research into what's in it. And we, again, you, you, we skip to the part that you mentioned about like uh, second guessing them and double checking them. And are they telling the truth? We'd like everybody else did that work. The part that's missing is the perpetrators coming out and saying, this is what we did. This is why we did it. This is the parts that you guys missed. There's probably like for the one or two or three Stuxnet things that we understood and saw, there's probably a dozen different versions of attacks that we didn't. And this is naive. Like I, you're, you're kind of leading me to, to, to sound no, naive I've, as fuck saying well, like, no. you guys need to come and tell us what you did. Right. Like I understand that that's not going to happen. I'm just saying from a policy perspective that the, the record shines by its absence and it's leaving a lot of space for idiotic accounts made out of people's imaginations to be treated as the subject matter of international law. And that, should change. Gustin, you've been squinting for like five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, there's just two things I was thinking about. One was that um, the more advanced you are, the less you want to talk about it because then all your naming and shaming essentially doesn't work anymore. Like you can just go uh, 
about and blame everyone like China and Russia for uh, doing cyber operations when but they still have way they still have big fast. military parades showcasing their weaponry and their advancements uh, in weaponry is it isn't it really like a 50 kilobyte file walking next to a <laughs> missile <laughs> exactly <in> a <laughs> What is like the last? I, I presume you're talking about the military parade and uh, the Russian military parade, the victory. No, all Day of these parade, military right? parades. What I'm saying is, people show mm. off armament, and that's a part of the game. Uh, why aren't we doing it? it is, with, but that's... Why aren't we doing it in cyber? Why aren't we saying, "Hey, capabilities! I did this. Here's capabilities." That's the question. I guess because the deterrent doesn't work in cyber. Like it does work. Like yeah, here's my big missiles and nuclear bombs. Uh, enough nuclear bombs to wipe the planet like ten times over and Mars uh, and Venus. But in cyber, it doesn't work uh, the same way. You can't say like yeah, look at all this malware that I have here, and if I want, I'm gonna unleash it like on you in your networks. And people are like just go ahead. <laughs> yeah. um, it, it generally it's like more of a close and dagger kind of a game and again the more advanced you are the less you want to talk and i think that recently china has been uh, yeah, essentially objecting a lot and uh, a lot and calling uh, western reports uh, as fake um, i mean uh, spionage reports and uh, yeah, essentially uh, going with this narrative that uh, in reality uh, apt operations are just uh, ransomware gangs and so on but the other big thing i was thinking about is that with the with the thing uh, heating up in the Middle East, uh, talking about uh, Iran, Lebanon, Syria, Yemen, essentially, and uh, the recent uh, events from this week where um, top Hamas uh, military commander was uh, assassinated in Iran, Hezbollah his commander, lover. his lover, that I do not know. But I was just thinking, like, uh, is Tuxnet 2.0 or maybe it's already 7.0? being deployed right now against Natanz or Fordo and against the other uh, nuclear enrichment sites. I, I think that uh, a lot, a lot... A lot of success stories on. are happening as we speak. Uh, right now, there's a lot probably mm -hmm. happening right now against uh, targets uh, in uh, all these different countries. Stuxnet 7.0 and friends <laughs> must be a lose in all these networks. Uh, I mean, Logic Bomb set up many years ago, ready just to, to be uh, activated any moment. And I was thinking that maybe, you know, why would you do this thing, like target all these different countries at the same time and like get everyone to just, you know, bait them into attacking you so you can just... Uh, uh, freely, it's open season, like uh, cyber and kinetic against uh, all your Summer enemies. of cyber. Summer of cyber, yeah. Hot, Could hot be. cyber summer. Could this be. is starting to feel like the podcast of Russia, in addition to the, the summer of cyber, because I want to close with the other big story. Just yesterday, there was this mm. big, complex prisoner exchange between Russia, the US, and a bunch of European countries, including, you know, led by Germany, making a big, giant concession on releasing one of the guys. But it does have a big cyber component in the fact that the U.S., actually, as part of the deal, the U.S. released two Russians that were sentenced to a combined 36 years in prison for some pretty serious cyber crime. Uh, this Vladislav Klyushin and Roman Seleznev. Um, it, it, there was a sentiment expressed I saw uh, from anti-malware researchers and guys involved in threat hunting that say, why do we go to all this work and all this effort to put these guys away if they're going to be exchanged in, in a deal down the road? It's so demoralizing. This prisoner exchange issue, Cold War, and where we are at now, that's another conversation about why we're even doing those negotiations. But were you guys surprised to see two cybercrime guys re re released? I wish. Like, I wish we were surprised. To be honest, the, the Russian practice of wrongfully imprisoning random Americans and foreigners is alive and well just for the sake of shit like this, right? That This has been happening for a long time. Where it's like, we'll just pick up four, you know, a couple of random journalists, one American tourist, some person that we're going to claim was like, you know, just the world's shittiest spy in Moscow. And we're just going to hold on to them for two years and leave them in a fucking penal colony. And then when we need to, you go, oh, send us the convicted assassin, the convicted like hackers, uh, a few spies, a couple of saboteurs, all of them people that have actually done fucked up shit and we'll give you back the like four tourists and two journalists that we've just been sitting on 
But like, it also says it also forever. says that it's important for the U.S. to keep picking up these guys and doing these, um, uh, you know, picking them up in third-party countries and bringing them back to face the law. Here, it's like it, it's the As same thing on both chips? sides. Yeah, isn't it the same thing on both sides? If this it's is where not it the ends same up? thing on both sides. If the same thing on both sides would be, hey, send us back our assassins and people that were doing sabotage and spies in exchange for yours. Instead, it's like send us, send us your activists and civil civil society people that you've arrested wrongfully because we're somehow defending this notion that like civil society must be protected and we'll trade them for your person who's going out there to like murder people right like it, it it's incongruous in that way that like i i want to hold on to the distinction because i think it plays into the propaganda narrative of equating all of us to say isn't it the same shit you go no it is absolutely not on a principled level. If Fair. we remove all principle, then yeah, it's the same thing. Five people for five people. Cool, right? Like, it, it's just, you, you can't let go of that part of it. You shouldn't. A big part of the story is that these two guys who were released, this Vladislav and Roman, were actually people with well-known ties to the Kremlin. One was a successful businessman, the guy who was sentenced to time for the insider trading stuff. And then the other guy, I think his father was like a, 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 some sort of government official in Russia. So these two were pretty interesting choices to pick because you can pick a bunch of Russian cyber criminals from our prison system to send back these two. Yeah, Austin, I, how is this I playing mean, in Europe? It's uh, very unlikely to think that a random Russian cyber criminal would be swapped in, in such a big high level deal. So, I mean, these are not just some random cyber criminals, uh, but I think they, they will be uh, on one hand success stories and on the other hand they'll be heroes so um obviously they get swapped because of their ties and because they are important people in the uh, in the full uh, power ecosystem in russia so they're not just some kind of random cyber criminals but again I mean, they stole in one case i think it was 93 million dollars so that's uh, still 100 million it's not uh, north korea level uh, it's not lazarus uh, level uh, theft 4 billion uh, 6 billion, 20 billion, and so on. But nevertheless, I, I mean, it's uh, essentially their connections that get them free. And the other uh, thing here is that they'll be seen as heroes and there'll be a huge motivation for other young people to essentially do the same because, uh, yeah, there's a low risk. In case they somehow get uh, arrested, there's a good chance that they'll be free then. They'll come back home uh, as heroes for life. I mean... Uh, yeah, they were met on the flight by the president of Russia yesterday. I mean, like... One of them, like, or or one of them, or one of the uh, copies, if, if you want. Either the original <laughs> or one of the copies. You I never know. know, you yeah. never know. I mean, uh, in communist times, I mean, the Ceausescu times, Ceausescu had like a, a number of doubles. And, okay. uh, you're some a, of Rome, you're doubles our were European talking. correspondent, bro. You got a European correspondent. <laughs> Our, from, from the former communist uh, uh, socialist republic of Romania. We are we are running out of time, my friends. This next week is Black Hat Week. We might be on a weird publishing schedule for next week's podcast. I, I'll, I'll sit with the three buddies and try to work it out. I will be at DEF CON on Friday co-hosting a live stream from DEF CON with my friends from Bishop Fox. So look out for that. Nice. I'll be sharing the link on Twitter. Juan, it's you're speaking free at Black free free stream. stream. Yeah, it's a free live stream we're doing on Friday from... Nice. 10 a.m. Pacific through the day with a bunch of guests lined up. So look out for that. I'm very excited about that. Juan, you mentioned at the top you're, you're speaking. Uh, what day and what time? Where do the people come and find you? Uh, so very first day, right after the keynote, um, Nicole Fishbein from Inteaser and I are going to be talking about uh, tackling the Rust reverse engineering problem. And, uh, you know, it, yes, it, it is kind of a technical talk, but more importantly, it's a, it's really an attempt to take away that fear and that lack of understanding that is keeping us from analyzing Rust malware properly because there's a whole side of the malware ecosystem we are ignoring because it's hard. Uh, and you would think things wouldn't be quite that simplistic, but they are. That's the same thing that happened with Go. I think we did a really good job of getting on top of Go to some extent. Now we're trying to do the same with Rust. I'm not saying it's going quite that well, but we're trying. So uh, I think it'll make for something interesting. I would ask Austin to plug something, but he's on vacation. and, and he's Don't worry, I'll be on vacation next week as well. <laughs> 
<laughs> exactly. Uh, one last thing. One last thing, Juan. When are we going to get the LabsCon agenda? When are you doing the announcements on the speakers? What is the next stage? So speaker acceptances have gone out. We've gotten most of our confirmations in place. Uh, and let me be totally honest with this audience. We're pretty much ready to announce. I just think we're not going to do it during Black Hat week when nobody's paying attention. So, you know, stay tuned. The week after Black Hat, we will be announcing all the speakers. The agenda looks absolutely insane. And uh, for our listeners, I will lean into disclosure and say that there's, I want to say, 30 tickets left. So 31. when that announcement gets put out, I don't think there's, there's not going to be a lot of wiggle room for signups. So please, if you're if you're interested in coming, sooner is better than later. Once once the spots go out, because of the way that the you know conference is structured and us holding the hotel rooms, like there's not going to be a lot of wiggle room. So. Yeah. You know, Not to make it a sales now. pitch, but we have <laughs> yeah, no yeah, we have no room for expanding it either, just because yeah. of the space constraints. And the, once the, it's the, done, it's done. So this will be FOMOCon. There is an overwhelming amount of off the record and TLP red talks. So just keep that in mind. One best of luck at Black Hat next week. Post in, take some more um, uh, mimoso pictures and send to us from your lovely vacation in Romania. Come visit us. Come visit Romania. You know, he's becoming the European tourism uh, you, director. You, you've been using him as the mouthpiece of Europe for like the past hour, man. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. We'll be back next week. Thanks, Ciao. guys. Bye. Arrivederci.